Well, we're returning to Samson. We've looked a little bit at the riddle of Samson when we started, and then a, a little in the last lecture on the need for judges. And now we're going to turn really to the need for Samson himself as it's presented to us in the book of Judges, which brings us finally to the Samson story, uh, beginning at uh, Judges 13, verse 1. The Samson story uh, takes up four chapters in the book, uh, chapters 13 through 16. Of course, we know these chapters are all uh, added later, but still they're helpful for us today to find out where we are and orient ourselves. And there we find um, the book of Judges declaring in verse 1, and the people of Israel again, and that certainly is the case, it's again. This is uh, the fourth or fifth or sixth time this is said in the book of Judges. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, that's a perfectly good translation, um, but in light of what's going to happen in this story and happens in other stories in the book of Judges, we might have left it just a little more literally because literally what it says is, and the people of Israel again did evil, did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, that's important because eyes are very important in this story. Uh, It's going to very much revolve around what Samson sees and what Samson does in relation to what he sees, and how at the end, Samson loses his sight. So uh, the theme of sight is introduced here uh, by the author right at the beginning. Uh, It's not only going to be a story about Samson's eyes, it's also going to be a a story about the Lord's eyes. And this this is set down right at the beginning. Again, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now you notice there's no great detail given here about what that evil was. Uh, And uh, our expectation is that almost certainly it was just like the evil that had been done in earlier times in the book of Judges. And the most detailed statement of Israel's faithlessness uh, is found in chapter 10 in the uh, description of what happened um, before Jephthah was raised up as the uh, judge in Israel. And at Judges chapter 10 at verse 6, we read, The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord or in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. So here's the description of what was at the heart of the evil that Israel did in the eyes of the Lord. They went after false gods. Uh, And if you Turn back, for example, to Deuteronomy chapter 4, a grievously neglected book uh, in the Old Testament. I think Deuteronomy is the third most quoted book in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus knew Deuteronomy backwards and forwards. Uh, If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses is pressing the claims of the covenant on the people of Israel, and he's making the point that the single most important point of the covenant, which is the sign of fidelity in everything else, is whether you're an idolater or not. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4, he makes at great length the point, when you were at Sinai, and the Lord your God came to make covenant with you, and the Lord your God spoke to you, and like no other people in the history of mankind, you heard the voice of your God speak to you, you saw no form, and therefore you are not to make images of anything in the heavens or anything in the earth, anything in the skies, anything in the waters under the earth, because when the Lord came to you, you saw no form. And this is to be a test for Israel. After all, if you can't do this one simple thing, namely not make an image He's not asking even that you do something positive. He's saying, just don't do this. If you can't discipline yourself enough to avoid this one external action of disobedience, 
how can we have any assurance that your heart is connected to the Lord? And, and so here, Israel is showing the heartlessness of her relationship to God because she cannot avoid idolatry. Not even, I mean, she's, she's worse than the idolatry in the wilderness because at least initially the idolatry in the wilderness was making an image of the Lord God. I mean, the golden calf was an image of the Lord God, and the Lord showed his anger about that. But this is much worse because these are images of false gods. And you see sort of the, the comprehensive way in which this is described. Uh, the people did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sail, served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, uh, the male and female gods of the peoples that surrounded him, the gods of Syria in the north, the gods of Sidon in the northwest, the gods of Moab in the southeast, the gods of the Ammonites in the east, the gods of the Philistines in the west. You see, they've, they've played the harlot with the gods all around them in every direction. And um, this is the grossness of the betrayal. And this is why the Lord uh, says here that he crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year for 18 years. They oppressed all the people of Israel. So they're sent into an oppression by the enemies for this sin for 18 years. Well, now we turn back, and that's sort of the context in which to read, they again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. It must be that again they had become idolatrous. And uh, we know that this uh, story will end in the temple of Dagon, right? Well, it doesn't quite end there, but it nearly ends there. Uh, and uh, it's, it's clear that Israel has been going after the gods of the Philistines. That's what the again means, I think. This idolatry is uh, back in their life. And so what happens? So the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, now think... Think how dramatic that number is for 40 years. Uh, we've been in the land of promise. God has brought us to the land flowing with milk and honey. He's, he's blessed us by giving us this land. And now it's like we're right back in the wilderness. It's almost like we're back in the slavery of Egypt because the enemy has oppressed us. Uh, and... This protracted period of time, 40 years, 40 years. And it's, it's a sign, it's a, it's a symbol of, of how far they have fallen, that it's as if they've been taken out of the promised land. And of course, that's ultimately what will happen to Israel, won't, isn't it? They'll be exiled after years, centuries of kingship, but already it's all being anticipated here. They're enslaved in their own country, 40 years. Think how long that is. Um, and here is the tragedy that is besetting uh, Israel. And what's the solution? Well, the solution has to be that God will raise up a judge again. And jo God has been doing that. Uh, but the judges have become progressively weaker. And the judges themselves have become progressively more sinful. And the fruitfulness of their deliverance has become shorter term. And so we can almost anticipate what's going to happen with this next judge who's about to come. But that's the background now for the need for Samson, for Samson to arise. And now we get to the Samson story. But of course, as we look, we discover we don't get to Samson. 25% of the Samson story is about his parents before he's born. Uh, so again, we're a little bit surprised by how this story is told. I think most of the time in Sunday school, when we talk about Samson, we don't spend a lot of time on his parents. But 25% of the story is given to the story of his parents before his birth. Uh, and so uh, clearly, the Lord intends that this be a, a preparation for us to really think about Samson and the context in which he's born, the task that the Lord is giving to him. And as we're going to study and as we're going to see, this story is very intricately told. 
very carefully thought through. And I think one way of, of thinking about the whole Samson story is uh, a story in four acts. It's almost a play. A story in four acts. Acts one, Act one is um, the parents of Samson and uh, the preparation for his birth as we find it in uh, Judges chapter 13. And then we're going to look at Act two, uh, which is uh, his marriage to the Philistine woman and uh, the disastrous consequences of that, uh, which really take up chapter uh, 14 and 15. And then we're going to look at chapter, at Act 3, which I think is Judges 16, verses 1 through 3. I think Act 3 is just three verses. Um, I'll explain that as we go along. And then we'll look at the fourth act, uh, maybe the most famous, Samson and Delilah, uh, chapter 16, verse 4 to the end. So here we have four acts. Uh, we could also say maybe four snapshots. We've seen snapshots all through the book of Judges. Four snapshots, four acts out of his life. He judges Israel, we're told, for 20 years, which is a relatively long time. Uh, and yet these snapshots we have, these acts of his life, are really very short. Um, the few days around his marriage to the Philistine woman and the tragic consequences of that, maybe another week or two. Uh, the one day of Act 3, those three verses, the beginning of uh, chapter um, 16, and then the Samson and Delilah story, which is maybe another few weeks. So out of 20 years, we really only have the story of a few weeks in his life. But obviously, these are the things that the Lord wants us to know. These are the highlights. These are the spiritually key uh, factors uh, in the life of Samson. And it's intriguing that each of these four acts in the life of Samson uh, revolves around a woman. Now, this uh, uh, is uh, part of the key to Samson. Um, Women are important in the life of Samson, uh, more important maybe than they ought to be. Uh, but uh, uh, each of these four acts revolves around a woman. Act one is about his mother, a pious woman we'll see. Uh, act two is about his Philistine wife. Act three is about a Philistine prostitute. And act four revolves around Delilah. So. Women are very important in the life of Samson, and part of what's being said, as is being said uh, in the whole book of Judges, women are very important in the history of redemption for good, as is the case with his mother, or for evil, uh, as is the case particularly with Delilah, but with the other two Philistine women as, as well. So this is a very intricately told story. It's very thoughtfully put together. And uh, its, its intentionality is going to help us see uh, what is the message uh, the Lord uh, wanted to have for his people uh, through this. So let's, let's begin Act 1. There are several scenes in this act, if we want to continue the uh, uh, theatrical image here. And scene 1 tells us there was a certain man of Zora, that's the town, of the tribe of the Danites, that's the region, not far from the Philistines, whose name was Manoah. So Manoah is the father of Samson. And his wife was barren and had no children. Now what's interesting here is that as we think about the women in the life of uh, Samson, the first three are nameless. His mother is not, she must have had a name, but we're not told the name of his mother. Uh, we're not told the name of his Philistine wife. We're not told the name of uh, the Philistine prostitute. It's only Delilah who has a name uh, in the story. We'll talk about her name uh, when we get to her. It's an interesting name. Um, but here is a mother who is nameless. And as we look at her, what are we told about her? We are told that she was barren and had no children. And we know that in Israel, uh, barrenness was seen uh, whether, not, not always rightly, I think, but was seen as uh, a curse of the Lord. 
Uh, not to have children meant the family wouldn't continue. Uh, not having the family continue meant not only that family property might be lost, but the line of Messiah might die out in Israel. So at the end of the book, there's a panic because it looked like the whole tribe of Benjamin might die out. So the dying out of families in Israel is a very serious matter. Um, and uh, so here clearly uh, the, the parents of Samson are being uh, presented to us as participating in the kind of judgment and chastisement of the Lord upon his people. And, and you get a sense, I think, um, that they are very fatalistic about this. They've, they're resigned. They've given up. Uh, Samson's mother, it seems to me, stands in marked contrast with Hannah. You know, when Hannah was not able to have children, what do, what do we read? She pled with the Lord. She prayed. She begged the Lord. She offered vows before the Lord. Um, uh, she, you, you know, she just was engaged in the Lord coming to her need. This mother seemed, or this woman seems not engaged in that at all. Neither she nor Manoah seem to be praying about this situation. And there's, there's this sense throughout the Samson story that um, sort of the life has gone out of Israel. The hope has gone out of Israel. Uh, there, it's almost after 40 years, they're not even looking for the Lord to act anymore. They're, they're resigned to their fate. And, and so we are introduced to a family in Israel that expresses the character of Israel in these days as pretty hopeless, pretty cast down, uh, pretty uh, despondent. And then, as so ha often happens in the Bible, in our worst moments, in our worst moments, uh, the Lord intervenes. The Lord acts. The Lord surprises us. And that's what we have in verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. Uh, now, you know the Hebrew word for angel. Um, angel is actually a Greek word. Uh, and both the Hebrew word and the Greek word mean the messenger of the Lord. Angels are always messengers of the Lord. They bear a word from the Lord. That's why they come. That's their function. And, of course, we also know that among angels, there's a special angel um, that uh, most scholars believe, most conservative scholars anyway, believe is uh, a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ. Uh, this is the eternal second person of the Trinity who takes on a form that can be seen to communicate the message of God uh, to people in the Old Covenant. So here comes the angel of the Lord who appeared to the woman and says to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. You shall conceive and bear a son. That sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Uh, here, is, here is the promise, uh, a, a proto-Messianic promise. You're going to bear uh, a son. And um, uh, it, it's interesting as we read along here that... Uh, uh, Samson's mother initially seems to think that this appearance to her is a man. Uh, she thinks he's a prophet. So he uh, clearly doesn't have wings. This is not an angel that looks uh, uh, obviously angelic. Um, uh, no sign on his chest that says angel. Uh, and uh, that's sort of intriguing, too, that uh, we find that uh, a number of times in the Old Testament that angels appear, but they appear in the form of a man and are initially appraised as being uh, a human being. But a little further in the text, we're told that the appearance was awesome, although literally in Hebrew it sort of was very scary. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that too, it regularly accompanies the appearances of angels in the Bible, doesn't it? Uh, what are the first words that angels frequently speak? Fear not, uh, because they're very scary. Uh, whether they just look like very impressive uh, human beings or whether they're actually perceived to be angels from their first appearance. Uh, but this angel appears with a promise. Um, this woman who has been barren and has not born a child will conceive and will bear a son. And so this has to have been news of great joy uh, to this mother. And uh, along with a, with, with a huge surprise, and then comes further words to the mother that are tremendously important for our whole 
consideration of this story and why I think the Bible gives so much attention to the parents before Samson comes on the scene. The angel says, therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So the word judge is not used here, uh, but the notion of deliverer is used here. And so from this first word of the angel, it's very clear that the son to be born will be a judge, will be a deliverer, will be a savior uh, to the people of Israel. He won't be the last savior. He won't be the complete savior. He's only going to begin to save Israel from her enemies. But that's his commission. That's his task. Uh, and so there's this sort of double promise, this double blessing, this double joy that has to have come into the heart of Samson's mother. She'll have a child, a son, and he'll be a judge. So in the midst of this depressed resignation and hopelessness comes a double promise of encouragement. But there comes also a very specific instruction, isn't there? An instruction both for mother and for child. And what the instruction is that his mother is not to drink and his hair is not to be cut. And these are not just random directions from the Lord. This is a reminder of the Nazarite vow described in number six. And in number six, we're told that some in Israel will be called to a special consecration, will be called to a special separation from the world and its practices. Not because drinking or cutting hair is wrong in and of itself, but they will mark their we might say radical dedication to the Lord, their hyper-consecration to the Lord by giving up things that would be all right in other people. And it'll be a mark of how completely their lives are set aside to the Lord. And this in Numbers chapter 6 is called a Nazarite vow, uh, which is another case of just not translating Hebrew words. Um, if you know, if the word angel is just a Greek word for messenger, why don't we translate it messenger instead of angel? Well, Nazarite in Hebrew is simply the word for separated. So the Nazarite vow is a separation vow or a consecration vow. And, and so this is really important. This is at the heart of who Samson is. He's to be separated unto the Lord. He's to be consecrated to the Lord. His life is to be different. His life is to have a special dedication. And so he's not to cut his hair, not because there's any mad thing magic in not cutting your hair, but because it's a constant sign to him that his life is different. Uh, if, if it's something special not to cut your hair, then it must have been common to cut your hair. And so whereas a lot of other men will have cut hair, he will have uncut hair. And this will be a constant reminder to him and others that he's different, that he's separate, that he's consecrated. And this is crucial, I think, as we conclude this look for the need of Samson. What, what does Israel need in Samson? It needs him to be separate. It needs him to be consecrated. It needs him to be holy. That's one of the meanings of holy, set apart. We think of Samson as strong. God wanted us to think about Samson as separated. And the tragedy of the story of Samson is his failure to be separated. Well, we'll go on with that next time. Thank you.